Uh, let's turn our attention to the welfare, the economic side of things. And we have joining us on the program here, Jonathan Nichave, who is a co-founder. Cesar Empowerment Foundation joins us via Zoom this morning. You're welcome to the program, madam. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. So you have bring to bear lots of competences. You, you're a politician some days. Uh, you have the welfare area covered, economics as well as uh, uh, basically... Political management. Political <laughs> management, right. Now you put it that way. So uh, speak to us about um, what the thinking in the government uh, quarters should be like approaching this. There, there are layers of demands, but some will say at the heart of it is just welfare, really. People want to be able to go to market and be able to buy food at a cheaper rate, uh, such that they can afford it mm -hmm. with their own take-home salary. They want to buy petrol, and they want to feel empathy from government. They want to look at government and see that government is uh, living by that, you know, the usual be patient with us, tighten your belt mantra themselves. So how do you expect governments across board to carry themselves to ensure that this is quelled? Thank you very much. Um, I think first and foremost, we should remember, and the government seems to not remember, that um, the sovereignty belongs to the people of Nigeria, according to our constitution. Uh, but the way our government carries on, um, it's whoever is in office, head of office at the moment, their word is law. And they do things that um, are extremely, um, I would even say, unpatriotic. Uh, the retired Brigadier General who spoke before me was talking about patriotism. And um, it's very ironic that um, the Nigerian government expects Nigerian citizens to be patriotic, um, to not protest, uh, without putting in effort in themselves to be patriotic. If you look at the elections, for example, the APC, I'll speak as a politician, but also as an observer. The APC actually had some people from the Niger Republic coming in. There were two personalities, I can't remember their names now, who came in and joined them on the campaign. I mean, who does that? And when people complained, the president, current president right now, had nothing to say about it. This is what his party was doing. So um, the hypocrisy uh, of the current party of the government, it's mind-boggling to, to perceive. Now, when we talk about the social welfare of the people, they forget also their primary job, and they're answerable to the Nigerian people, is to provide for the security and the welfare of the people. They provide for their security and their welfare without providing for ours. So you're telling everybody, tighten your belts, you came in and you declared them on the inauguration day itself without a plan in place that uh, well subsidy was over. At the same time, you floated the Naira. Who does that without a plan in place? There was no clear long-term plan. There was no clear plan to address the basic fundamentals of the economy. How are we going to generate power? How are we going to move from consumption to production? How are we going to ensure we have food security? because we're dealing with insecurity. In the last year alone, between 2023 and 2024, Nigeria mourns a group and coalition of civil society organizations estimates that at least 9,000 people have died as a result of violent terror attacks or other violent related incidents, including members, uh, the gallant members of our security forces as well. The government does not take very serious actions to address these things. They owe pensions on sometimes, they're owing salaries in some places, and I'm now talking at various levels, basically. Right. Hello? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Please go yes. ahead. They're talking at various, they're talking, I'm talking at various levels right now. So it is extremely unfortunate. Um, so we're not talking about how the government is tackling uh, food security, which has led us to this crisis where we have food inflation of over 40 percent, 40 percent and more. And uh, we're talking about the reason why do we have food inflation? So the first, the previous administration shut down the borders, shut up the price of all sorts of things, right? And before, uh, when the president was on the streets many years ago protesting under President Jonathan, a bag of rice was how much? I think 8,000. Now a bag of rice is about 90,000, 100,000. People say they want to protest and air their grievances 
And they spent so much energy at all levels of government, even roped in all actors, other churches, other groups, all sorts of people, to tell the people not to protest. Where were you when you were making policies that would jack up the price of these things without having things in place? Now, what the people simply want is an enabling environment. You're increasing taxes, you're squeezing the people, you're pushing them to the wall, and then you want them to be patient with you while you are living large. You're going to hospitals in France, your Dubai, your children or the children of your officials are not in school in Nigeria. And they're being paid ostensibly from Nigerian funds. And they're paying for these things. We have a former governor who paid thousands of dollars in advance for his children's school fees in a school in Abuja. This man is walking around scot free. And the people themselves, someone goes around with a laptop. He has a legitimate source of income, but because he has a laptop, he's wearing dreadlocks, you go and arrest them and say they are 419. Now, please tell me, who is the real 419? So these are some of the things that the people see that really makes them really, really angry. And they're struggling. The number of people dying every day because they cannot afford medicine, they cannot afford basic food, all these things that the uh, governor, uh, president came to say in his address. For the people, as far as they're concerned, it is just, as we say in, in our local parlance, to range, what is your plan to get the price of food down? What is your plan to ensure our farmers right. can go back to their farms? That is not being addressed. Instead, they keep telling us it's taking right, to right, take right, a year, I'm, I'm to take longer, it. to make sure security, whatever. It's 14 months. The people that hit the streets. You you didn't wait 10 right, months right. for President Jonathan. You hit the street. What kind of hypocrisy is that? Right, so that's what people are seeing. So I think um, I'll just close out to say that the government needs to seriously go back to the drawing table very quickly and address the demands of the protesters and tell us there what is the plan and start putting in place this is not to be sending us palliative rights. If you send me palliative rights, I'll eat it today. Tomorrow I'll be hungry again. I'll still hit the streets. Now. Well, if, I'm if, I'm if, I'm if I'm a button so that, so that we can make some progress with this. Uh, uh, so let's, let's, let's talk from where we are now. The government has raised concern about a possible hijack. We tend to be seeing that happening right now. So uh, as much as there is that hunger in the land hardship, which everybody knows and nobody can deny to that, um, in going forward, how should the government manage this entire process? In your view, as far as the protest is concerned, should the people call out the protest because of what is going on in the north or government has to step in to manage it in such a way uh, that people can still have their right to protest while they, they attend to the issue of the looters? It, it looks like a my complex brother, mix. How would you advise? My brother, my brother, you have said it's the latter part. Our government's duty is to provide security for the people. You know, it boggles my mind. People who are supposedly exposed who have lived abroad, the president himself has lived abroad. He has participated in protests where he was protected by the police in this country. They, they see how it's managed elsewhere. We've seen countries where they've been protesting for days on end. Nobody came out shooting live ammunition at peaceful protesters. Nobody does that in other countries where they're civilized. It's only in Nigeria that they do it and the president will come out and not address that. So they should Protect. Let people have the right to bear. It is their constitutional right. Even we people of faith, when we're not happy about something, we complain to God. God, who is all-powerful, does not strike us with a thunderbolt. So how is it that the Nigerian government thinks they are even better than, bigger than God? That when people come out to protest, they will send police in, and their first response is aggression, tear gas. And then when that doesn't work, they will now start throwing live bullets, ammunition, killing people. That has not been addressed. So the government needs to address first and foremost the aggression of its own security forces, killing unarmed citizens who are protesting, using tear gas on people. Yesterday, one of our colleagues in the civil society space, her, her windscreen was shattered by a police canister that was thrown, a tear gas canister that was thrown. Who does that? And she was not being aggressive. Her car was parked. I think she was just trying to navigate her way through a section of the street. So they need to protect the protesters and organize themselves. I don't know what has happened to their budget. How is it that the only response they have is tear gas and uh, live ammunition? What happened to rubber bullets? What happened to dealing with um, armed rubber bullets? What happened to water cannons? I hear one was used somewhere, but not even used properly. If you see the way they even came out, armed to the teeth, 
Meanwhile, we're losing 9,000 people on average in the last one year due to kidnapping attacks and so on and so forth. Our children are being abducted in schools. When that time comes, you don't see that kind of aggression all across the nation. Yes, our forces are doing their best in fighting some of the Boko Haram and so on and so forth, right? But when it comes to dealing with innocent citizens, we now see all this ammunition. That's not the way to go. Uh, the so the government, on its part, right. needs to recognize the right of people to protest because they too protested. When they come out of office, they too will protest. And they should set the tone for making sure that protesters are safe. Lastly, please, I will say this. This happened during NSAS. <laughs> this happened, is happening now. And the government needs to get out of this terrible, ungodly behavior where peaceful protesters are protesting. Thugs are attacking those protesters. Usually, uh, there's even evidence that comes out afterwards that those thugs were funded or were brought to that place by people who are affiliated with the current with the government in, in, in administration. All right. Those thugs don't get arrested. We have one where somebody actually, they're threatening peaceful protesters. We saw that in Lagos and in other places. They don't get arrested. But once the protesters get on the street, they'll start shooting at them. That is wrong. So the government should investigate that. And I think the Inspector General of Police and President Bola and Tinubu should be held responsible for the people who have been killed while protesting peacefully. Thank you. Uh, the police had to release a statement some days ago explaining their own side of the story, but they've not updated that uh, for the past uh, two, three days now. So it's, uh, it's expected that the, the police will give an update on uh, the recent happenings. There's another, another part in the mix, uh, which is the, uh, the protesters waving the Russian flags. We've understand in Katuna, they saw the Chinese flag as well. So that's another dimension, different moving parts. Uh, but as we look to the way forward, because I think that's what everybody wants, even for the protesters, they want their demands met for government. They're just hoping that this will end uh, and all of that. Uh, if you were to have a sit down, and I'm going to try to break this down uh, with first the president, the governors, perhaps local government officials and other elected officials and appointed officials, uh, is there a one-liner that you would give them that will maybe drive the point home for you uh, if you were to have a sit down with them or maybe confront them right now? What will that be? <laughs> I would say um, that one-liner is we're going to cut our costs. We're going to cut our wages. We're going to actually live on the minimum wage we have said we're going to give you to live on. And we're going to start using Nigerian hospitals, Nigerian schools. We're going to stop flying abroad. We're going to sell that jet. So it's, is it one paragraph? I won't say one paragraph. Go ahead. You <laughs> There's can, so you much can give us one they paragraph. need to show that they are ready to cut government expenditure. And those savings can now go into that, into, into making sure that they put in place short-term uh, uh, measures, mm. medium-term measures, long-term measures to provide uh, an enabling environment for people to be able to, to live. Right. That's all Nigerians need. I'm curious, uh, you ran for office, uh, am I correct, for the House of Representatives? Absolutely, I ran for the House of Reps, Kwandi Ushungo, uh, exactly. federal constituency, so last year. Let's imagine for a moment, hypothetically speaking, that you won and you're now a member of the House of Representatives. So naturally, you would have that responsibility uh, to speak to your people. You will also be part of the people in government. So this end bad governance Absolutely. chant will mm -hmm. also touch you in that sense. Uh, is there something you'll have done differently? I mean, we have 360 of um, reps, 109 mm -hmm. senators. Uh, if you had been appointed, sorry, elected, not appointed, would you have done anything different from what you're seeing uh, the representatives across the board doing now? Uh, well, I, I would have definitely engaged more with the people. Um, I don't know where my rep currently is. We're in touch once in a while, um, so I will not speak for him and say, oh, this is what he's doing, so I would have done it differently. No, I'll speak generally what I know. What we've heard and what we've, we've uh, is that a lot of our legislators have taken off and left the country uh, for fear of different attacks or whatever they thought they were being afraid of. Um, I would have gone to my constituency. Um, I would have definitely done my part to, to try and just alleviate uh, the, the, the hunger. Um, one of the things I had proposed in my campaign was that we would have a fund where um, a lot of the constituency funds and allowances that came would be uh, managed by people from my constituency to see how we can invest in industrializing my place as best as we can. 
um, and building strong partnerships with various entities, NGOs, and so obviously that's my background, um, private sector, to really see what we can do to provide jobs and um, to support uh, education, our children in education. So definitely, uh, I, 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 I would have uh, been in the community doing that. Um, I don't expect that um, I would have taken off to England or gone off to wherever uh, while my, the, my constituents are, are suffering and, and really struggling and having a really hard time uh, doing, you know, just going through things. And I will say, and this is an appeal, uh, permit me to use this platform to appeal to all our community leaders, be a judge leader, whatever, you know, support the people at this time. You know, we keep seeing all these statements, don't protest. I'm not saying you must join the protest, but let us empathize also with, Niger with the Nigerian people. Too many of our elite community leaders um, are too quick to side with the government when, they have, when the people have been oppressed by our government. And what we're having is real oppression. We're living like slaves in our own country. I mean, look at us, National Grid has collapsed how many times? Who has been held accountable for that? No one has lost their job for that. You know, and these are the things we see. This is the, these uh, are the things uh, that make uh, Nigerians so disheartened. And all right, so madam, as we wind down, as we wind down, I would like you to speak to the young people. Uh, one of the challenges governments even across the world is having, especially on the sub in the sub-region, is the issue of leaderless protest. And... Um, Sometimes they're always shouting, who is the leader, so that we can engage in all of that. So in speaking to young people on how to advance their cause, in calling the attention to, of government to their concerns, uh, what should be the best way forward? Because sometimes it looks like, you know, they're they not listening. If we could, people are saying that the president's speech uh, was just rehashing what we already know. I was criticized by senior advocate Falana, criticized by Walesh Inka and Nobel laureate uh, as missing the point. So what should they do going forward? You know, um, I don't really worry about whether a protest is leaderless or leaderful or whatever. You know, people talk about those things. I'm saying end bad governance. What do you want to negotiate in ending bad governance? End the bad governance now. Stop the corruption. Stop the bribery. Stop the people who are not doing their jobs and you're leaving them there and paying them our money to continue messing us up to continue having us in power. Don't stop it. So what do you want to negotiate again? That's my own. The demands are very clear. Reduce the cost of food. You know, someone said, oh, what would we do different? We should advise the government. What are you advising? What am I advising you for? She said you're the best uh, person for the job. You have access to the best advisors in the world. You have the World Bank, you have IMF, you have all sorts of technical people. You say you've assembled the best technical team all sorts of papers have been written about the Nigerian situation since independence. We have white papers that are sitting there, all sorts of recommendations. They are not implemented. So what is it that you want to negotiate again? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Is that you want to tell me, okay, let's wait so that more of you can die. Then I will have time and sorry. whatever. They're already talking 2027. Me, I want to survive. These young people, they see that they have no future in Nigeria. Instead, we're seeing billboards all over the place talking about Let's stop cursing Nigeria. Nobody's cursing Nigeria. Instead, it's our leaders that are cursing Nigerians with their bad actions. Well, great so place to answer, our own definitely. Is end bad governance. That's what the youth are saying. There so I go. don't know what it is that you want to sit down and then negotiate on ending bad governance. That said, if it is that you're saying, okay, you want to sit with people who have said, okay, this is, uh, you know, you want to say, oh, give us uh, three months. Uh, we promise we will do ABC. And then we can sit down at the negotiating term table again if we don't do that. Right. You know, maybe. But you're also dealing with things from bad in bad faith. First all and right. foremost, your speak your all your your spokesmen came out. The vice president himself called the protesters' names. The other the, another person said it was being organized by one ethnic group against the other. So first, you're dealing with bad faith. So the the that's why they, these things appear leaderless because they don't trust God. Well, we have to anchor to this point. Uh, but clearly, so lots of things see to what take there home. Is to negotiate about hunger, right? Cost of living, insecurity, corruption, right. and so on and so forth. Clearly, there's lots of take takeaways uh, from, the, from the, the points you've made. And we can sit down later uh, and talk. But Thank we have you. to anchor at this point. Um, quite an interesting conversation, I must say. Uh, so wait to see how government uh, proceeds from here. I would like to thank you so much for speaking with uh, the co-founder, Sess Empowerment Foundation. The political Thank manager, uh, she ran for House of Reps under ADC, here, Jonathan Ichave. Thank you for your time on the program. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. And you too. But we'll take a moment now. When we return, we'll hear from, well, a representative of government, someone who is right inside the cabinet of President Bola Tinubu. She's made several points. Uh, the Brigadier General had made several points as well. But how is government taking this on board? And what is a way forward for government? You don't want to mix this next leg of a conversation. Stay with us. <laughs>